Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we come into this place after a trying week. We cast all our cares on you. We, we bring them into the throne room. We throw them right down in front of your throne, the mercy seat, because that's what we need. And we lift up our hands. We stand before you. We bow before you. We sit. We kneel before you. And we cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, the creator of the universe, the redeemer. You are the lamb that was slain. And we bow before you, O Lord God. We thank you for this moment. Pray you speak to us in your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you so much. We are so excited that you are here today. This is a, a, a special day because obviously uh, you have probably have now heard that Zach and Riley and Paxton are adding a new addition to their family. And I just want to ask Zach to come up and just come right on up here. Zach, we are so grateful for this. I'm especially grateful. I just want to say publicly thank you to Zach for choosing the name Patricia. Wait, wait, just hold on. I'm so touched by that. Zach. It was a good idea, and it was a good idea, Patrick. I appreciate and it so much. Thank you. I really Riley. liked. I really liked the idea, but me and Riley have talked it over, and we've known Phil longer, and so we decided to go with Phyllis. So. Um, Phyllis, little Phyllis McDonald will be joining us soon, hopefully. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> we are so excited that uh, Zach and Riley are going to be adding a new baby. We're going to celebrate that new baby tonight, little girl. And, of course, we're going to be celebrating Archer Sutherland, too. But we have kind of a special feature right now. Um, we are here before you today to announce that... Zach and Riley are going to be taking a different position in Collegedale, Tennessee, and are going to be leaving us. I believe if we took a motion right now to not let them go, and a second involved voted it, I'm not sure. I think the, the skid has been greased, and they are, they are headed down to be a part of the Collegedale Chattanooga community. So, Zach, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I just first wanted to say it's not you, it's me. I feel like we needed to do that first. Um, uh, we are going to miss you guys a lot. It is a very hard decision on our part. We have so enjoyed being here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here over the last four years. Um, it's been such a blessing to be able to serve you and your families and, and the people that, that are not here that will soon find out and be mad at me too, um, that are viewing online. Uh, but thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm going to be taking a job at Southern Adventist University um, to be their ministries coordinator and admissions counselor there. Um, and we'll be close to Riley's family um, and also close to Asheville. We're only three hours and some change away. And trust me, I've learned the, job, the route already. I know how to drive back and forth. So we would love to be back as much as we can and, and be able to spend time with you all. Um, but again, thank you so much for all of your love and support in, in an, our time in ministry here, but also it, your continued prayers and support in our ministry that we're going to be moving to. to. So um, we're excited and, and we're sad as well. When are, you? when are you taking off? Oh, yeah, when am I leaving? Uh, I'll be here for a little while. 2027, so he's just giving <laughs> yeah, you notice. Just giving you a warrant, no. Uh, I will be starting down in, in, in Chattanooga September 1, so I'll be... Uh, back and forth, some between now and then, and the baby comes hopefully in 10 days somewhere in there. Uh, that's why I didn't make her come up here, because she's sitting, and so uh, you, can, <laughs> you can talk to her afterwards. Uh, but yeah, we will be gone September 1, and I'm, I'm preaching the last of, of this month. August so. 27th, and we are going to plan some sort of wild, crazy send-off for Zach and Riley and Paxton and baby Phyllis on the 27th. <laughs> so... Um, we are just so sad to see them go. Let's just bow our heads and have a brief word of prayer. Phil, why don't you pray uh, for us here today? Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what Zach and Riley and Paxton have meant to us here at Foster. And Lord, we're not going to say goodbye now because it's still, wow, just three, three whole weeks away. So we'll have time to do that. But we do want to thank you for the ministry, the gifting, the talents that you've given this couple and this family and how they've shared with us here. And we just ask a blessing 
on them as they move on to Southern, and they Southern is uh, all the better because they will be there. And Lord, just bless us here as we fill that hole, and uh, may we all just join together in celebration of spreading Jesus Christ everywhere we go. And Lord, thank you for Zach and all he's meant to this pastoral team here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I also wanted to mention the video series. We're still, we're still working on that. So keep, keep watching to hopefully do more of those as well. Maureen and I have a friend, Rob Wilkes is his name. When Rob was a young man, a very young man, he and a group of his friends were at a river, the Potomac River, stretches between Maryland and Virginia and D.C., runs down through D.C. And they were up on the river and um, they were all swimming and enjoying the river together and Rob decided that he would uh, dive into the river and, um, and swim and when he dove into the river, he hit his head against a rock and broke his neck and became paralyzed. Uh, Rob is now uh, my age or a little bit older, and he's lived his entire life with paralyzed limbs. Interestingly, during that story, the story goes that Rob was floating with a broken neck, unable to move, floating in the water face down. And his friends thought that he was just swimming and enjoying the water as he drifted. And a man rushed off of the bank, ran into the river, and pulled Rob from the river and saved his life. And when they turned around, this man was gone. That's not to say this was an angelic thing. It may have been a human being. But sometimes human beings are angels too. The song that you heard beginning worship today says these words. When did I become so numb? When did I become so numb? Rob is paralyzed, but sometimes I feel like I'm the paralyzed guy. When did I become so numb? When did I lose myself? All the words that leave my tongue feel like they came from someone else. When did I become so cold? When did I become so ashamed? Where's the person that I know? I'm paralyzed. Where are my feelings? I no longer feel things I know I should. I'm paralyzed. Where is the real me? I'm lost and it kills me inside. I'm paralyzed. We're walking through the Gospel of Mark, and I'd like to ask you today to open up to Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. The last time we were together in worship, we talked about a man in a synagogue that had a withered, paralyzed hand. A withered, paralyzed hand. Only two events in the Gospel of Mark mention paralyzed limb. The paralyzed hand in the synagogue that Jesus said, stretch out your hand, and it became restored and whole just like the other. And this passage in Mark chapter 2 about paralyzed legs. Verse 1, when Jesus had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. Interestingly enough, the text here calls Capernaum Jesus' home when we know he was born and raised in Nazareth. You see, this was after Jesus' experience in Nazareth, when he was rejected by his family and his friends, and he had to seek a new home. So he went, I believe, to Capernaum and began living with his uncle, Zechariah, uh, uncle uh, Zebedee, and his aunt, Salome, and their two sons, James and John. So Capernaum became his home. And several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. This is a map of Galilee and Capernaum. 
And you see Capernaum nestled on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee, right in the midst of the territory of Galilee. So Jesus is in Galilean territory, Jewish territory. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. What would it be like if a congregation were so full of the Spirit of Jesus that the sanctuary was so packed that people had to stand by open windows and open doors to hear the gospel being shared? What would it be like? The more Jesus there is, the more people are attracted to him. People are looking for answers. People are looking for hope. And you can only find it in Christ. Only in Christ. The solution to our problems is in him. Many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even at the door, and he was speaking the word to them. That's why they were there. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Numbers are very powerful symbols to the Jewish people. The number 12, for instance, means something very particular to the Jewish people. It goes back to their very roots, the 12 sons of Ishmael and the 12 sons of Israel. Seven is a very important number to the Jewish people. It means completion, finishedness. Goes back all the way to creation. Four used in the Gospel of Mark in only three incidents. Talks about the 4,000 Gentiles being fed by fish and loaves. Talks about the Four winds of the earth where God will gather his elect from the four winds. What does that tell you about the gospel and salvation? Everybody, everybody, only those who reject will not be included. They came bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get into him because of the crowd, what would that be like? That so many people were hearing the good news and the word proclaimed and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we were so filled with the Holy Spirit that people were clamoring to be a part of Foster, that when people in need came, they couldn't even get in the door. Unable to get into him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. In that day and age, roofs were made of soil, dirt, and then they were covered with tile. So you see, they removed the roof above him and began to dig an opening. They began to dig down through the roof and the dirt. I can just see Jesus there sitting and preaching the gospel, the gospel concerning himself, because the good news is always about Christ. I can just see him sitting there in a a little bit of dust beginning to fall down before him and a little more dust and a little more dust and pretty soon you hear the scratching and the pounding and they're breaking through the timbers and all of a sudden the dust collapses in front of Jesus and light shafts through. Can't you just see the congregation looking up? What in the world are those guys doing? Probably thugs bringing someone to Jesus. And they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. They lowered it by its four corners right down in front of Jesus. Almost symbolic of the four angels lowering humanity in his presence. They let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And then Jesus now Jesus sees this man who has been paralyzed. And he's lowered down in front of him in the synagogue. And Jesus knows that this is a paralyzed guy. And what does he say? 
Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. He's a paralyzed guy, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. He doesn't even address the paralysis, because there's a deeper paralysis that is important. A more powerful paralysis caused by sin itself. The guy's arms and legs not moving, that was nothing for Christ. The forgiveness of sin, that's what this guy needed. During that day and age, there were actions that you could do, choices of lifestyle that you could make that could literally lead you to paralysis. It's very possible that this man's paralysis was a result of his own sin. Very possible. And Jesus looks down at that guy and says, your sins are forgiven. I don't know what you've brought here today. I don't know what's paralyzing you. I don't know what sin has done in your life. I don't know how, how it has crippled you. But hear these words to this paralytic as if they were the words of Jesus to you today. Your sins are Forgiven. Stop thinking that you have to do something for the forgiveness of sins. This guy couldn't move. He couldn't perform penance. He couldn't go on a pilgrimage. He couldn't hold down a job, much less pay tithe. He is incapable of anything. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. A book called The Desire of Ages says that when the man heard these words, he lay back on his pallet satisfied. He didn't say, yeah, 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 that's fine, but can you fix my arms and legs? He heard the words, your sins are forgiven, and he was satisfied with whatever happened in his life because he realized that there was a deeper paralysis than just arms and legs. It's the paralysis of sin. Your sins are forgiven you today, not by virtue of anything that you have done but by virtue of a cross that Jesus would in just a few short years be nailed to. Some of the scribes were sitting there, reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Who indeed? That's absolutely true. Only God can forgive your sins. Who is this guy making himself out to be? Just who does he think he is? This is no ordinary prophet. This is not a good teacher, an excellent rabbi. This is the only person in the universe that can forgive sin. Who is he making himself out to be? And Jesus knew it immediately. Immediately he knew what was in their spirits. Aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves. He said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? Why are you thinking like this? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, pick up your pallet and walk? Which is easier? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. 
And he got up immediately. Notice, friends, your sins are forgiven. Notice that when he said, pick up your pallet and go home, I, if I have the power to forgive your sins, if I am who you think I'm saying I am, then I also have the power to restore your arms and legs. Pick up your pallet and go home. Notice what the paralytic did not do. Do you see what he did not do? He didn't lie there. Once you hear about healing, you are healed. Stop rehashing the past. You are forgiven. You know, Zach, you're going to College Dale, Tennessee. Gordon Beats was my pastor there when we were at College Dale, Tennessee. And I heard Gordon Beats tell this story once from the pulpit in the College Dale Church. He said, I had a neighbor, and one day I was backing out of my own driveway and didn't see that my neighbor's dog was behind the car. And I rolled over my neighbor's dog and killed it in my driveway. He said, I was so heartbroken. I immediately pulled forward, but it was too late. So I went to the, this poor dog, and I lifted this dog up. And I went to my neighbor's door. And with the dog held in my arms, I rang the doorbell. And my neighbor answered the door, and there I am, standing in front of his door with his dead dog in my arms. And I said, I am so sorry. I was backing out of my driveway and I ran over your dog. I am so sorry. And the neighbor, with tears in his eyes, took the body of the dog and said, It's okay, Gordon. It's okay. It's okay. They took that lifeless dog out into the backyard. They got a couple of shovels. They dug a grave. They placed that dog in the grave and they covered the dog with dirt. They embraced. And once again, the words were heard. It's okay, I forgive you. It's all right. So he went about his business. That night, Gordon was lying in his bed about three o'clock. Darkness all around and he couldn't sleep he couldn't sleep because he had run over his neighbor's dog. So he went to his garage and got a shovel. He went out into the backyard of his neighbor and he dug where they had buried that dog and dug up the dog and took the dog in his arms and went to his neighbor's front door and rang the doorbell. And his neighbor, wakened out of a deep sleep, comes to the doorbell and sees now this dirty dog dead in Gordon's arms. He says, what are you doing? And Gordon said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I killed your dog. Once again, they take the dog back into the backyard and bury the dog and cover it with dirt. And the neighbor says, Gordon, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. The next night... Gordon goes back to the dog and digs it up and takes the dog in his arms, now beginning to smell of decay, covered with dirt, and takes it to the door of his neighbor and rings the doorbell. I've killed your dog. Please forgive me. Some of you are digging it up over and over and over again, and you're not listening to the words, your sins are forgiven. They're buried in an empty tomb, Stop lying there. Take up your pallet and go home. Go, serve. This paralytic, when he heard these words, your sins are forgiven, get up, pick up your pallet and walk, did not just lie there. Pick up your pallet and go home and immediately he got up picked up the pallet, went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. You know why the community doesn't look at us and say, 
wow, we've never seen anything like this because we've heard the words, you're forgiven. We've heard, pick up your palate and go. And we're still lying there thinking we're paralyzed. Sometimes paralysis is just in the mind. Some of you do not serve because you are paralyzed by fear. Jesus went out again by the seashore and all the people were coming to him and he was teaching them. What is it that paralyzes us? What keeps us from moving outside of ourselves? Sin. Sin paralyzes us. Deeds that we know we shouldn't be doing take up our time, incapacitate us, distract us. There is a strong, strong possibility that this paralytic was paralyzed by his own sin because Jesus, knowing the man's heart and situation, addressed sin first. So if sin is paralyzing you today, hear this, your sins are are forgiven you. You are free of that. But the danger is, the danger is that we make sin only equivalent with deeds. Sin is so much more than just deeds. Sin is not just an action. It is also an attitude. And it is possible that we are paralyzed, that we are incapacitated by our attitudes toward one another. Unforgiveness. Arrogance. Hard-heartedness. Bitterness impatience, selfishness, seeing the shortcomings of someone else and not seeing the faults and flaws in yourself, treating others more harshly, more impatiently than you have been treated by God himself, being judgmental of other people or being judgmental of the judgmental. All attitudes that will paralyze you and keep you from living out the glorious destiny that God has for you. What is the solution to this? The solution to this is to see yourself clearly, to see your own need, your own paralysis, and to come to Christ for healing. And I don't care what it takes for you to get there. Come. Come. If you have to Get four of your friends to carry you. Then pick up the phone. See your own needs. See your own paralysis. And come to Christ for healing. Do you not see your need today? Do you not need to see, to see that your actions need to be changed? There are things in your life that you need to be grown through. Do you not see that your attitudes need growth? Mine, mine does. It is only in this way that we will be healed. Only in this way will our paralyzed legs be given strength to walk and to take the good news beyond these walls For you today, whether you are struggling with something in action or something in attitude, these words are for you. Your sins are forgiven. Rise up, take up your pallet, and go. Just a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Both passages occurring in Galilee, in Capernaum, in fact, Jesus' hometown, both in the synagogue. But in one, there's a withered hand. And this withered hand is shriveled up and incapable of giving. Jesus says, stretch out your hand. 
And this man with a withered hand stretched out his hand, and it was restored. Gail, what are the chances that we could pull up that video right now? We're going to make a spur of the moment change. Our goal is to use this technology so that these patients, like Ian, can be more in charge of their lives and can be more independent. What our device does is it takes data directly from the brain, so it creates what we call a neural bypass from the brain over the injured part of the spinal cord and back down to the forearm, uh, bridging over that, that injury. Man's paralyzed and, and he's moving his arm. When we first hooked everything up, you know, for the first time of being able to move my hand, it was a big shock because, you know, it's something that I haven't, hadn't moved in about three and a half years at that point. Now it's more of something where I expect it to move. We're thrilled that um, Ian has progressed significantly with this technology over the past year. And uh, this really provides hope, uh, we believe, for many patients in the future. This will allow uh, the millions of patients around the world who are living with paralysis get back to a level of independence that they had before the injury. The biggest dream would be to get full function of my hand back both my hands, you know, because then that allows you to be a lot more independent and not have to rely on people for kind of simple day-to-day -day tasks that you take for granted. How about that? How exciting is that? This is a guy that physicians are going to help use his hand. He's playing, what's the game? Guitar what? Guitar Hero. He's playing Guitar Hero, man. Imagine the joy in his life, he was paralyzed from the neck down, and now he's playing Guitar Hero. Imagine the joy in that paralytic's life. Imagine the joy in the man with the withered hand. Imagine that joy. Let's go back one. Can we go to that last slide there, Gail? The one with the two. There you go. Imagine that, that man stretched out his hand and it was restored. That was amazing. But not only that, in Mark chapter 2, 1 through 13, we see this other paralysis in the same synagogue, paralyzed legs. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Take up your pallet, get up and go, and restoration occurs. These pairings, these pairings of events in the gospel of Mark, where Mark is pairing things up. What's he doing? What's he saying to us? Let's pray. Gracious Father, as we're walking through the gospel of Mark and we're seeing that, that your disciple, your disciple Mark, this, this secretary of Peter, writing down Peter's stories, we see that he's doing something unusual here, that he's pairing these events up Help our minds to be clear as we seek to see what he is saying to us in his gospel, especially in the Galilean ministry, but all through the gospel. And especially today, Lord, we're grateful for the healing of the man with the withered hand. How awesome are you, Lord? You are the great physician. No electrodes, no chip in the brain. You were just able to fix that withered hand. And then this man lowered down in your presence, paralyzed. How awesome is that? Lord, help us to see ourselves in these things. Help us to see that you are able to heal us of our hard-heartedness, our, our attitudes, our actions that are not like you. I'm the paralytic today, Lord. And I need your healing. Help me to act like it. In Jesus' name, man. Can you not imagine what it's going to be like for our friend Rob? 
dove into the river, hit his head, broke his neck, became paralyzed. Can you not imagine what it's going to be like when Jesus comes in clouds of glory and he is healed of that and he is able? He's going to be like a calf out of the stall, man. It's going to be awesome when Jesus fixes Rob's paralysis. But let me tell you this. Jesus has already fixed Rob's paralysis. He is one of the strongest, most godly Christian men that you will ever meet, no matter what our physical. Let's be sure that we are alive and well in our spiritual lives.